we're going to do an overview of this document called the Software Requirement Specification, or the SRS. And this is a document that you're going to create and then be building on for the rest of the semester. And the purpose of this document is a contract between you and the client that is going to list in detail all of the functionality and all the expectations of the system that you are proposing. So we're going to move through it section by section to give you some tips and hints and tricks on how to fill this out. So the first thing that I would say before you even begin the SRS document is to complete the discussion assignment called the LARD Factor. The LARD Factor is an assignment that's supposed to help give you some insight on how we use words in our writing, how we can be more detailed, clear, and concise. Another thing that I would like to suggest is not to write in the possessive tone. And in the SRS, don't say things like, I will, or we will. You're going to say things like, the system will. And I also don't want you to write in a passive tone. So instead of saying, the system might, perhaps, maybe, kind of, sort of, I want you to say, the system will. It will not do X, Y, and Z, but it most definitely will do A, B, C, and D. I also don't want you to use flowery sort of exaggerated words without some kind of a definition. What does huge mean? What does beginning, intermediate, and advanced mean? Because if you use exaggerated flowery words like we're going to bring the client into the 21st century, whatever they feel that means, they're going to hold you to that. The last thing that I would say is um, we're going to assume that this document is being created for a non-technical audience. And so don't use technical terms without an explanation of what those terms mean. So let's move through each one of the individual sections of the SRS. If you read the first page, it indicates to you that this is um, in conformance with some IEEE standards. This is by no means the only SRS document that you might encounter throughout your career as a computer scientist, a programmer, a software engineer. But this reads, this uh, contains a lot of the components and the parts that you would find in some kind of a requirements document. In bold at the bottom of this page, delete this page before you submit it. On the first page, you're going to give the project a name, you're going to give it a version number, who it was prepared by, that should be you, and the date, the origination date. The second page contains a table of contents. Make sure that these um, section titles are hyperlinks to the sections in the document and make sure that the page numbers are correct. You'll be submitting this both electronically and in hard copy, and the electronic version should have accurate hyperlinks. The printed version should have accurate page numbers. The revision history, the very first entry, is the creation date, and you'll be adding additional dates for each revision that we make to it, each subsequent homework assignment. For the introduction, I would recommend one or two brief paragraphs introducing the client's business and the problems that he's having, you know, the ones that your new system is going to solve, and then how your proposed system is going to solve those problems. The purpose and intended audience is the purpose of this document, not the purpose of the software project that you're proposing. Who is the document being prepared for and why? So you can start with the wording that's provided in the second paragraph of this template, the one with the bulleted list. That is an excellent place to start. The project scope focuses on the limitations of the system and the area of the business, what it does and what it doesn't do. You don't have to be very detailed here. You could include a brief one paragraph summary of the scope, something like the product will do X, Y, and Z, but it will not do A and B. The terms definition and acronym section is meant to clarify terms that you use in this document. Terms that might have an ambiguous meaning. Remember the document is for the client, so include any terms that non-technical people may not be familiar with. You also want to alphabetize and bold this list of terms. The last item in section one are the references. This section lists where you got all the information about your proposed system and its features. Did you get them from interviews or discussions or reading the client documents? This is not where you're getting information about, say, hardware or software that you want to include, but specifically the information on the proposed system itself. If you have documentation, such as a client document, you're going to give the name of those documents here, and then you're going to include the, the entire contents of those documents in the appendix section. 
So let's move to section two. 2.1 2 is the product perspective. And this is one or two paragraphs of high level marketing about the product. Pretend that you go into Best Buy and you're going to buy some software. You pull a box off the shelf and there's going to be a couple of paragraphs about how wonderful and fabulous that product is. That's what you're going to put in the product perspective. Product features, this is also high level marketing and this is going to be a bulleted list of the features you might see on the same box at Best Buy. So when you turn the box around because the paragraphs kind of made you interested, now you're going to see a bulleted list of features. It will do this, 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 and this. The next section is user classes and characteristics. This is a list of who will be using the system and their expected skill level with technology. This is not a list of, of the user's functionality with the system. This is their skill level. And you want to break this out by the user groups because we can expect each user group to have a different set of skills. Once again, don't use vague subjective terms like intermediate, beginning, and advanced to describe their skill level unless you have defined what those terms mean. 2.4 is the operating environment. This is how where, under what conditions the system is going to be used. Is it going to be used indoors or outdoors with multiple users or with a single user? The design and implementation constraints. You want to include information that we need to be aware of that might impact the development of the system. Things like access to third-party vendors or third-party applications. In the dependency section, you want to include anything that this particular system might be dependent upon such as if there is current hardware or current software that it has to interact with, or if there are certain requirements on dates. Section three is where we're actually going to list the functionality of the system itself. This is where we're going to describe the specific functionality of the system from the client's perspective, broken out by each one of the individual user groups. What I want you to do is imagine what each user group is going to be doing within the system. There is an example of functionality for all users and for managers and owners and for maintenance personnel. I would encourage you to take a look at these examples and build upon this. Remember, you have a variety of different user groups, so you're going to want to make sure that you fill this out to include all of the functionality for all of the different user groups. This would be an excellent place where you can use your homework groups as a good resource to brainstorm functionality, to brainstorm the different user groups. The last section that we're going to be doing in homework number three is section number four. And this is a list of the non-functional requirements. If you remember when we were building our system request, we were talking about things that added value to the business. There were tangible and intangible benefits of the system. These non-functional requirements could be considered the intangible benefits, the things that are going to add value to the company that are not so much measurable and quantifiable. This template mentions the FERPs. You can either use the FERPs or you can use the non-functional requirements that are listed in our textbook on page 87 and 88. The FERPs plus refers to functionality, usability, reliability, performance, supportability, and the plus is any miscellaneous items that are not covered before. You can list the non-functional requirements using the FERPS Plus, or you can use the non-functional requirements that we discussed in class and that are listed in your book on pages 87 and 88. These are the operational, performance, security, cultural, and political requirements. You can use either one of these. This template has a section 5 and section 6. We will be coming back to these later. For now, homework 3 only requires that we complete sections 1 through 4. But there is one last thing that I would like to mention, which is at the bottom of your template, and that is the appendix. Make sure that the appendix includes the contents of the documents that you receive from the client. If there is any reference material, such as client documents or discussions or other sort of things, make sure that you include the contents of the document, not just a link. Another thing you should do is make sure that you include the appendix in the table of contents. It is not currently there, and so you're going to need to add the appendix to the table of contents. So hopefully you have a bit more information about how to fill out this document. If you have any questions, you're more than welcome to ask me. And I would strongly encourage you to collaborate with your homework group to brainstorm some of the different sections and the information that goes in there. Keep in mind the assignment that you did on the lard factor and let me know if you have any questions.